Greetings everyone, this is the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage channel. Appreciate you tuning in if you are tuning in. If you have not subscribed, please feel free to do so. There's no cost and it will uh, make it a little easier for you to keep up when new videos are posted. So what are you looking at today? You are looking at the carrying case for Singer's all new or sort of all new machine for 1958. This is the Singer, one of the Singer 500 series machines. And I will take the cover off here for you guys. Now, <laughs> this machine is kind of interesting. It, doesn't, it is not one I purchased. It belongs to a client. And uh, they've asked me to look at it. This client has done some work on the machine. Uh, but they have a few questions about it. I'm going to kind of give it kind of an overall diagnostic. I'm not actually restoring this machine. Um, after I inspect it, they can let me know if they want me to do any further work on it. So, what are you looking at? It looks like it was all new for 1958. But when you go underneath, you will discover, in fact, if you ever have one of these, it is extremely similar to the Singer 400 series. So 1955-56, Singer introduced the 400, the series of machines called the 400 Slant-O-Matics. And these were a big deal. This was Singer's sort of second time at the bat for coming out with a new um, domestic or home version sewing machine that could do zigzag. Uh, along with a number of other things. They had tried zigzag before, but Singer was a little slow to bringing zigzag to North America. Uh, and they were even slower to adopt uh, what would, we would later expect as a, as a fairly common um, feature in sewing machines, uh, free arms. But this machine also has been nicknamed by many of its fans, the Rocketeer. Why do they call it the Rocketeer? What does that mean? Well, the Rocketeer is a name that was given um, to this machine by its fans. Singer didn't call it the Rocketeer. The name, I believe, may be associated with the fact that this machine was was a basically the new and improved version of the 400 series. Mechanically, and there's a few exceptions here, guys, and I'll, first of all, I guess I can unwrap the the, uh, I will be needing this because we're going to test it. You guys are going to watch me test the machine so we can kind of listen to it and see what's going on. Um, this, of course, is the button style foot pedal, which is very common, uh, tried and true. I mean, it's one of the most common foot pedals you will see in vintage sewing machines. Uh, anyway, and it has a new plug. Now, those of you who know the 400 series and the 301, or the 300 series, if you want to call it that, beforehand, they basically had a plug system that involved two plugs. You had a plug for power that went into the, to the right side, and then you had a different plug that was attached to the foot pedal. The foot pedal looked similar. It was the same, basically. And it had sort of a, I don't have it in front of me here, guys, but it's the sort of a, I don't know, like a, like a, curved puck shaped plug. I don't even know if that's right. Anyway, it had either two or three prong capability. Well, in 1958, remember, it's a very competitive marketplace. And even though the 400 series, which was the 401, the 403, which I made a video on, you guys saw that machine, it's since been sold. And then they had the 404, which was a straight stitch version. <clears throat> So for about two, two and a half, maybe three, if I'm pushing it, Singer sold those machines. They were, they were the most expensive and the most sophisticated home sewing machines that Singer had ever made. Well, 1958 came along and Singer decided, which was kind of unusual for, for them to be making lots of styling changes, but they actually created what they called the new 500 series. Now the 500 series consisted of the 500A, which would be similar to a 401, right? It had almost all of its decorative stitches were built in, and then you could get four. I was showing this in a in a in a little separate video the other day on uh, on cams. There were four extra cams. They were called special discs, and. Um, and those were to give you even more decorative stitches because they could only cram so many built-in cams, right? So that would have been the 401. Well, the 500 is 
the new and improved version of that machine, but that's not what you're looking at here. If you guys look closely, this section of, the, of this, this is a 503, Singer 503, and um, it, it is very similar mechanically. Some parts are identical to the 403, right? It has the uh, needle positioning or the stith, stitch width adjustment right here. And then you can push in and, and change the needle position. It's kind of a wonky design, this one, but it works. It's, it's well made, just kind of odd. Um, and you have stitch length control here on the front. The 400 has the same thing. It has a very similar motor to the 400 series, or the 403 in this case. It has, of course, as Singer was advertising and pushing with the 400 series, the first uh, top-loading bobbin in front of a needle, right? That was the big the big deal. You could, I think their, their marketing stuff said basically you could see it more easily. That may be true, I don't know. You guys who use, uh, who've used many of these machines can, can tell me what you think about that. Um, so if, you know, why would they go through something like this? Well, if you ever look at uh, cars, a lot of times when you when a new car comes out, it will be out. These days, a car will be out usually at least three years, maybe four, before they do what they call a mid-cycle refresh and they'll change some styling and then eventually they replace it with an all new model, either by the same name or not. Well, that was true um, in the sewing machine world, but in the, in the late 1950s, there was so much competition for business that car companies literally would change, they would change the body style which means all of the, the tooling and the die, um, the die presses to make shapes in steel had to be changed at great cost. So if you were to look at Chevrolets from the late 1950s, you have the 55, then you have the 56, which has different sheet metal, 57, different sheet metal, 58, 59. I mean, every year they were changing the body style. And I have a feeling that even in consumer items like this, uh, it pushed a company like Singer, which was a much slower company to make changes and, and, and fuss, fuss over little changes like this. Even Singer got involved. So uh, let's talk about some of the differences. I'm going to move the camera up a little bit more for you guys. And we'll take a look and I'll show you what <clears throat> what is the same. Sorry about the bobbling here. I'm trying to adjust me and the camera. Um, so let's talk about the changes. There are some significant changes, but in some ways it's the same machine. Okay, the, um, one of the things you'll notice is this is very similar to the 403, as is this, as is the fact that your feed dogs, in this case, the feed dogs don't adjust up and down. The needle plate does in order to prevent the feed dogs from engaging fabric when you want to do free motion embroidery or darn, darn a hole in a piece of fabric. Uh, bobbin system is essentially the same, same bobbin case. And let's see, underneath, ugh, this actually doesn't tilt back. I'll have to uh, uh, let's see if I can pick it up out of its case here, if it will come out for me. Yay. Okay. And I'm going to go like this on the back side, and we'll take the back panel off. And if you have one of these, you've already seen it. This is a, looks like a tan felt washer, which is, is used to keep the, the, uh, this little uh, hand nut from scratching the paint. But when you go underneath, you see the same thing you would see under a 403. You see this metal pan, you see the felt, which um, uh, I'll ask the client if they want to replace this. I could do it, but they could do it themselves as well. It's not that tough. But look here, guys. You see, here's the same setup for the motor as the 403. The gearing is virtually the same as far as I can tell. Some of you guys go behind me. You may be spotting some differences. I can't or I'm not remembering. I don't know if this was the same. Point being, <clears throat> the mechanics of how stitches are formed on the 500 Rocketeer series is the same for the most part as it is on the 400 series, okay? The motors are not always directly uh, swappable, but it's a very, it's a direct gear motor, very similar to the one in the 301. These motors do not always, inter are not always interchangeable, so you'll have to, to double check before you try to swap around with motors, but the design is essentially the same. Um, sometimes they make slight changes, but, you know. Um, now let's see what else is, I told you guys that a lot of this is 
the same. Uh, the dimensions of the bed are the same. In fact, you guys may remember the 403 used to live in this 50s blonde table that I'm so enamored with because of its expandability. And uh, this machine would fit right down into this table. In fact, this table, I'm sure, was still for sale and available for the 58 Rocketeer models or the 500 series, which is what Singer called them. Um, there's something interesting here. I'm looking and it's, it's the oddest thing. <coughs> I'm going to zoom in. You guys can see this. I just noticed it having taken the machine out. Now it says it's stamped in ink April 23rd, 1981. Well, we know this machine was, you know, this machine was... Um, in 1981, this machine was, you know, over 20 years old, right? 58, it would have been 23, 24 years old, if I'm doing the math that well in my head right now. Uh, and I suspect this has more to do with servicing. Some service center went in there and they decided to, um, uh, you know, maybe stamp it to say, okay, this is the last time we tuned it up. And while we're here, it's, it actually might be helpful to take a look at this. This is a sticker you often see on 400 series machines. And so let's take a look. What does it say? It says, this sewing machine has exclusive features which are manufactured under issued and pending United States patents, including one or more of the following issued patents, which is kind of interesting. They put all these new patents. Now, Singer had a lot of patents, but... And this shows you, and I think most of these patents were going to be similar to the 400 series. But this was a very huge project for Singer. By that, I mean the Slanomatic series beginning in the 400s. Notice it says the Singer Manufacturing Company, Elizabeth, New Jersey, USA. That's where Singer was headquartered. That's where the original big Singer factory in the, in the United States was. Of course, Singer was a global company. And... Uh, I believe this machine was actually manufactured in Anderson, South Carolina, because Singer uh, opened a plant there when they launched the 301. That's why you sometimes see, not all of them, but a lot of selenomatic machines will have, um, they will have, uh, what am I trying to get at here? Uh, they will have um, lots of, uh, models will have the letter A on them, right? And that stands for Anderson. Sometimes they don't have the A, so there's that. Um, and you don't actually see the model number printed here, which is kind of interesting. Okay, so we talked about some of what was similar, right? Now, I'm going to show you guys some of the things that are different. And there's quite a lot that's different. So Singer didn't, you know, it's not like this was just a lame, you know, re, you know, change of color and things. There are some some differences here. The first, of course, is that the plug now has a special four prong plug. It has this funny shape, kind of like a shield. And just as with the 400 series, especially if you had, I don't know if this was included or if you had to pay extra, but because of the way this machine sits in the case and or a table, they basically you provided you an extension, a plug extension is what this is, right? So the plug from the from the hand from the hand from the foot pedal, sorry, will uh, will plug in. I don't have enough hands here. Will plug in like this, right? And then around the side, which we need to talk about anyway. Singer did make a change over here. What did they change? There used to be a big uh, receptacle for the, the main power plug, and then you had a smaller one down below, because remember the, the, the foot pedal had its own plug that went into the machine separately. But look, if you see now, you will see, this is just a, an opening showing the motor casing, and there's the one plug. Singer went to a simpler system. I don't know if this was because of costs. I don't know if it's because people complained. I, I really don't know. But anyway, that is a change they made. Now, uh, you can see, I'm going to go ahead and plug this in because we're going to do some testing on it. But look, notice when I plug it in, there's still, you know, there's still, you need that extension. Uh, but what if you didn't have the plug? What would you do? Well, we take this off of the extender. I, can I plug this in? I can, but notice the machine's not in the, tra in the uh, carry case tray because the machine would normally sit in this tray and you would simply sew on it. You, didn't you wouldn't normally take it out of this base, right? The base, uh, although you could, you could put this right on a, on a we call it, you know, 
put it on a tabletop dining table. It's got rubber feet and it's just fine, but people often left it in the case and you can see the hole in the side of the tray. So that was important, right? And then we have these. Now these are interesting. These are screws or bolts maybe and and so i'm gonna have to go and look and see i'm not i've not really paid attention to those before and i don't know if they were to help anchor the machine into the tray so it wouldn't come apart i don't know you guys help me out if you know that the answer to that question uh by the way by 1958 singer had moved away at least for these new models of having wooden carrying cases now i can just imagine you can just imagine Singer saying, well, the, these plastic, you know, remember, remember, plastic was a very modern uh, space age high tech material. Uh, it wasn't new in the 50s, but it was being pushed more and more as, you know, the wave of the future. And you can see Singer saying, well, look, it, it's much lighter. You don't have to carry as much weight because <laughs> the machine's still pretty darn heavy. Um, but, <clears throat> and I just noticed this. Look here, folks. Can you guys see this? I'll zoom in. There's another stamp here. No, not there. Move over here. Uh -huh. Here is the stamp I just found on this um, on the inside of the of the tray, and it says January 18th, 19. I don't know if this is going to focus in for you guys or not. 1962. Now, what does that mean? That could be a servicing. Uh, I don't normally see stamped dates on Singers, so this is the first time I've seen them, so I don't know. Like I said, it would have been made around 1958-59. I don't know if it sat in inventory distribution and finally got sold in 62. Who knows? It could have got in for its first, you know, one year or second year or whatever um, servicing. But anyway, I just thought that was interesting, you know. So I'm definitely not going to clean that off, and I'll mention to the to the owner, maybe leave that on. It's part of the history, right? Part of the pro provenance, if you will. Okay, so let's go back to the machine and talk more about what was changed. And again, it, it, was, it was really the marketplace that drove a company that was conservative, even like Singer, to make changes. They didn't get many years out of the 400 series and they went back and changed the tooling and changed the shape of the body. <clears throat> they also changed the hand wheel. Now you remember that the hand wheel uh, on the prior Singers had been, on the 400 series, had been just like the 300 series. It was a very traditional looking uh, hand wheel. Well, to change the styling and make this look more like a rocket, thus the name Rocketeer, Remember, the, the name Rocketeer is, um, I don't know if there was a cartoon uh, that, that used that name, but, you know, the late 50s and early 60s are referred to often as the age, the space age, and by that mean, they mean the, the race to get into outer space with Sputnik in the 50s and then the, you know, the space program at NASA, and um, that's a lot of times what they're referring to. You'll see all kinds of consumer items that have this space uh, mid-century modern look everything from stereos to to you know hand mixers in your kitchen so this is a pretty dr radical change in the look now these hand wheels still function the same sort of so here's the hand wheel the gold rim and if I turn back then of course I can stop the needle disengage the drive shaft and wind a bobbit okay and so it's still working the same. It's not the. It, it's not until the mid '70s we start changing how these things work. It looks dramatically different, but it's eh, at the end of the day, it's not that terribly different. If I take the hand wheel off, you should be able to see, if I recall, a uh, a washer behind there. Okay, so we've got different plugs, different hand wheels. We have. I like having the machine on this mat. It makes it easier to spin around. Now I'm going to tilt the machine back, and. We have Singer had still been maintaining. Here is the, the housing for the light bulb. It still has a lens that's made of glass. That would change when they went to the 600 series. They started making this little lens out of plastic. Does it make much difference for your purposes? No, but you know, again, it's a Singer would have said, "Oh, we're we're, we're saving weight. It's also cheaper than glass." Um, but anyway, I'm I'm like I say, I'm picking out some smaller details here. Now, let's take a look at the, um, let's take a look at this, this section in here when you go to thread the machine, because um, 
the way the threading works is different. And we're gonna, I'm gonna thread this machine for you guys and show you there. People have, you know, somewhat different ideas about, you know, there, there may have been some changes in how you could thread it for, for the best tension control. Um, let's see, on the side, you have this really, just, just really amazingly fun, curvaceous, like I say, they really changed the styling. And there's something else. Can you guys see it? When I notice that the, the side door opens like the old 400 series, but it's a lot more curvilinear. Uh, the style, it's mostly a styling change. You see this big oval shape up top. You see a lot of ovals in late 50s, early 60s designs. Uh, you know, sometimes the atomic symbol is in that shape. But there's another big difference here. Normally, you control the pressure of the presser bar, right, when it's going up and down. You control that traditionally with a big uh, bolt up top and you would adjust it either down or up to lighten or increase the tension. Well, Singer changed. They went to this side and there's like a button here and you, you actually change that. You can hear it clicking here. Uh, they work fairly well. Um, and this is kind of a good place to remind you guys uh, that Whenever you pick up a vintage sewing machine, I think I may have mentioned this once before, but it does bear repeating. You never want to pick it up like this. Okay, let's shut this door for a minute, right? You never, never pick up a machine like this, okay? Always pick it up and make sure that light has, is cooled off. You don't want to burn yourself. Pick it up like you're picking up a puppy under its belly like this, right? Some people will grab it one hand here, one hand here. I know this sounds silly, but the hinges that control these these little side doors, this is true for Singer 301s, all the 400 and 500 series, <clears throat> and I suspect the 6 and 700s. The hinge that holds these, there are two little hinges that this little swinging door hangs on, and they are no bigger around than an eighth of an inch. Or no, they're actually, they're smaller than that, guys. I think they're, I don't even know what the exact spec is, but they're very tiny and they're made of a soft metal. I don't know if it's aluminum or some other alloy, but it is very, very fragile. And many of these machines, you sometimes see them and these doors are gone. And it's usually because somebody grabbed it and just ripped it right off. They can be repaired, but it's kind of a pain. Um, I used to be able to get the little pins that would go in here to try to rebuild them. But what happens if the metal hinge itself breaks? I had that happen once and had to repair one. It's not easy. So be extra kind to this, okay? Now, let's turn around and look at the back. The back, the shape of the back changed, right? So they changed the shape of the body. I suspect the chassis is all the same, but Ch Singer changed this shape here. Um, what else did they do? Of course, the top is, is remarkably different. Um, and I'm gonna show you what it looks like when it's open from the back. He's like, well, where are the, where are the spool, pin, uh, spool pins for the thread? We're gonna take a look at that. Okay, let's get a little higher elevation here. I can do that. I'm gonna raise the camera up for you guys. Okay, so this is another big change for the for the 500 series versus the 400. When you open up the the back, you see a little diagnostic here, or a little little guide, if you will. Not a diagnostic. I'm sorry, a guide, and it's basically giving you some helpful hints. This is what you do here. Now, if you had the 500 or in, in the 400 series, the 401, there's a lot more information on here because you have all these different combinations of, of adjustments you had to make for the built-in um, cams to work. Well, in this machine, it only takes, this machine only takes um, the cams you insert. It's just like the 403 in that way. You need, in order to, you can only do a straight stitch with this machine unless you have at a minimum, you've got to have the zero, the cam number zero, which provides zigzag. It's such a lovely day out. I've got the uh, windows open and wanted to wait until that noise pollution passed here. Okay, so, so notice though, guys, when I close the lid, instead of it smacking into these spool pins, they retract, okay? So these spool pins are spring-loaded, right? So when this is closed, right, and then they, are, they're under tension. And there are little um, built-in, I think they're, they're, there's some sort of glue that holds them there. This machine has um, kind of a built-in felt washer, right? Again, that's to keep the spool 
uh, spool of thread from bouncing around all over the place. But look here, what do we have here? We have something else. We also have, and some of these, some of these will go missing. Someone has replaced the felt washer on this. This is something you think, well, why do I have this? Well, some people wanted to close the top and sew with the thread from the top. So you, there you go. You can, it's a removable spool pin designed that way. And if you don't want it or you want to keep up with it, it goes right there. It has a little place to live. Um, and of course, the other major change is that the bobbin winding device was moved from the front. You know, one of my favorite bobbin winders is the, the bobbin winder that Singer used on the 300, 400 series. It's very simple, easy to get to. This one is not hard to use at all, but it begins to use, and you see this more and more as we get into the 60s, more and more of the bobbin winders get away from the front of the machine and they end up on the top. And then of course, the uh, this here, I have to look, this looks like, I don't know, we'll see if this, yeah, let, let me pull this forward. Let's pretend there's a bobbin in here. I think I have bobbin thread. Yeah, there's thread on this bobbin. But when the bobbin uh, is inserted here, you pull. And notice when I pull forward, this engages the, the winder um, shaft. And then it pushes the bobbin tire, which you guys can't see, up against the side uh, of the... Um, in this case, it's not, I don't believe it's the handle. I believe it's actually coming into contact with the, the motor gear in some way. But anyway, they, they made this change. Again, I don't know if it was for styling reasons or what it was. Um, and we'll have to see what's going on with this. I'm going to kind of take a look at it and see if it's loose, uh, if there's something that needs adjustment or the spring's getting tired. I don't know. Um, one of the great things about this particular example is I see a little spot here right? Which could have just been a defect from when it was made. But the paint on this machine is remarkable. There's like, there are like one, two specks here, but almost the entire bed is gorgeous. And the paint is so shiny. Again, I don't know how often this was used, right? We don't know how often somebody sewed on it, but it's, it's awfully clean looking. <laughs> Granted, it was in a case and those machines typically, uh, don't have as much dust and grime as those in tables, but I think this is extra clean. And I, I don't know for sure, guys, I have a feeling this machine wasn't used very much. Um, just because people had sewing machines doesn't mean everyone loved to sew all the time, if at all. Um, but it was, you know, it was a thing you were expected to have. So what other changes, uh, what am I missing here? Uh, I've covered what I believe are most of the changes for that, that went from the 400 to the 500 series, right? So uh, again, a little video to kind of show you guys why is it called the Rocketeer? Uh, it has to do with all the styling and almost, you know, people sometimes say that the 500 series is only an aesthetic difference, that it's all the same as the 400. Well, a lot of it is, a lot of the main uh, mechanical mechanisms, you know, the drivetrain, the needle bar, um, certainly the motor, but there's, you know, they, they spent more money making this change than I think they get, get credit for because it was quite, they made a number of shifts. And again, most of it looks like it was done for styling, maybe some of it for cost. These machines are really strong. They're just as strong and should make the same stitches as a 400 series. And just like the 400 series, they can sometimes be a little fidgety and fussy with tension. Um, I don't really have that issue in Singer straight stitchers, but the zigzaggers, sometimes you have to play with them a bit. Uh, but like I said, this is still slant shank. If you have slant shank attachments, they should all fit this machine. And uh, again, this is the 403. Uh, I believe it was made in Anderson. I don't see 403 or A on this machine at all. And so there you have it, guys. Some of the differences between the 4 and the 500 series. This video is now just hit 29 minutes long. So we're gonna do a separate video on actually trying to kind of give it a diagnostic, see what's going on with it, what's working, what might not be. Uh, and the clients have asked me about the motor and if it does make the sound, does the sound sound normal or is there something amiss with the motor? And that, that question comes up a lot with any of the Slantomatics. Thanks for watching guys and watch for the next video when I will actually be uh, going through this and checking it out for the client. Thanks for watching.